Amen. Amen, amen. We sing, O ruler of all, in Romans chapter 9, we indeed crystal clearly see that the God of the Bible is the ruler of all. I invite you to open your Bibles to Romans chapter 9 as we continue our series in the book of Romans. Our text this morning will be verses 14 through 18. Romans chapter 9, verses 14 through 18. But I'm going to read Romans chapter 9, verses 4 through 24. And by way of reminder, there is a concern that Paul is addressing. You see, the majority of Jews in Paul's day and continuing today rejected the reality that Jesus was and is the Christ the Messiah of Israel. So the concern is, has God's word failed? Has God's promises to Israel failed? Let us read, beginning in verse 4 of Romans chapter 9. This is the word of God. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God. The children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said, about this time next year I will return and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were born Though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up that, my, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? What is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desi desiring to show his wrath and to make some, or to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy which he has prepared beforehand for glory. Even us, whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. Let us pray. Father, we come to you because you are the one true God. We come to you humbly this morning as we hear your word. We confess openly that there are truths within this text that are hard for us to accept, that we desire to defend you, yet we are unable to defend you, for you need no defender. You are good and righteous and just in everything that you have done, are doing, and will do. 
And though the doctrine in Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11 are hard for us to understand, we read and we study and we search and we ask that your Holy Spirit would give us understanding not according to our desires, not according to our inclinations, but according to the truthfulness of your word. You have said in the past and you have said in this text, you will have mercy on whom you have mercy and have compassion on whom you have compassion. Your distribution of mercy is not dependent on our will. It's not dependent on our acts. It's not dependent on our thoughts. It's not dependent on our feelings. It's dependent on you who have the right to choose freely and to bestow your grace and your mercy upon whomever you will. So Lord, would you humble us and will we rightly understand your word this morning and be changed by it for your glory's sake and for the well-being of those around us. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. It's not fair. It's a fra- favorite phrase of children. They often use this phrase incorrectly when the circumstance that they are speaking of is not really a matter of fairness. Earlier this week, my daughter had a dentist appointment, and she came home from the appointment, and she said, Dad, it's not fair. I said, well, what's not fair, honey? That I have to wait 30 minutes before I can eat again. (laughs) The phrase, it's not fair, unfortunately, does not retire as we mature into adulthood. If you were to visit any coffee shop in the area, for an hour and listen to the conversations that are going on around you as you sip your skinny vanilla latte, you would notice that many of those conversations have the same root. It's not fair. It is interesting that fallen mankind is so enamored with the idea of fairness. We rarely can get a group of people to agree upon the specifics of what is fair or what is not fair in any situation. Society's general idea of fairness is largely based on our biased perspectives and our limited knowledge. Yet at the same time, our desire for things to be fair and our desire for things to be just and our desire for things to be right springs forth from the very fact, the very reality, that we are created in the image of the only one who is eternally fair the only one who is eternally just, the only one who is eternally right. But due to man's fallenness, he cannot rightly judge what is fair apart from God's spirit and his word. Nonetheless, we often think, we often say, or we often express, it's not fair without any biblical warrant whatsoever. The notion of this phrase, it's not fair, did not originate within our lifetime, within our time frame, within the last century, within the last few centuries, but the Apostle Paul anticipates this very thought, and he deals with it in our text, which was penned nearly 1,962 years ago. In the immediate context prior to this point in Romans, Paul has been showing that God's faithfulness to his promises are certain, for his word has not failed, yet a question arises. How is God righteous and just if he elects, if he chooses, certain people apart from their works and not others before they're even born? That's the question that arises. Paul understands that if his audience has been tracking with him up until this point, if they are following his logical argumentation, then some might conclude that God is unfair. He's unrighteous. He's unjust. In short, some in his audience are thinking, it's not fair. Perhaps there are some in this audience who wrestle with and might even be thinking the same. It is upon upon that understanding that the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, addresses the assumed objection to his teaching in the form of a question in verse 14, which is where we pick up this morning. In Romans chapter 9, verses 14 through 18, God displays 
that his sovereign selectivity in bestowing mercy upon some and not to others is to the praise of his glory rather than the questioning of his character. In this text, God displays that his sovereign selectivity in bestowing mercy upon some and not to others is to the praise of his glory rather than the questioning of his character. To put it another way, this text, in this text, God proves that his divine prerogative in the election of some and in the rejection of others is primarily for his purposes and to his glory so that we might be humbled rather than antagonistic. I want us to see four points in this text. The first is that there is a wrong concluding question in verse 14a. Then has God unfairly withheld mercy? And what the Apostle Paul does next in the second point is he gives a strong correction. He says, not possible in the second part of verse 14. And then what he does is he gives us two explanations. The first explanation is our third point. And he, he reaches back to the book of Exodus a word that God gave to Moses that teaches us that God's mercy is not dependent upon the acts of men. And then he gives us a second explanation, which will be our fourth point, which is a word to Pharaoh. In that text, the Apostle Paul clearly shows that God extends his mercy as he wills. With that being said, let us begin with the first point in Romans chapter 9, verse 14. The text again reads, What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? Paul proposes an objection to his own teaching in the form of a question. Paul assumes that, again, if his audience rightly understands his argument in verses 6 through 13, then some will come to the conclusion that there is some measure of unfairness on God's part. In verses 6 through 13, among other things, Paul argues that God chooses to bestow his mercy upon some while simultaneously rejecting to do the same to others. And this is not based upon the actions or the desires of man, but it is based upon his sovereign free choice. Look with me in Romans chapter 9, verses 11 and 13. Paul speaking of the, cho- the children of Isaac and Rebekah, he says, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She, told, she was told, the older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I hated. In verse 11, Paul clearly gives to us the purpose. God's purpose is, is that in, the or, in order that God's purpose of election might continue. And so we ask, well, well why Jacob and, and not Esau? We can just go to the text and find the answer to that. The answer is in order that God's purpose of election might continue. So Paul has just declared that God sovereignly and purposefully distinguishes whom he elects from whom he does not based upon nothing other than his own divine prerogative. In other words, God is sovereignly selective in whom he calls. If this is not what Paul is teaching, then the question that is stated in verse 14 makes absolutely no sense at all. The question about God's justice only arises if you rightly and naturally understand Paul's preceding verses. It arises because Paul has clearly stated that God chooses some and not others regardless of their works. Based on that doctrine, Paul anticipates that some will charge God with this injustice. And so what he does is he forms the question, is there injustice on God's part? Or the NIV simply says, is God unjust? Or the NASB says, there is no injustice with God, is there? And the King James Version says, is there unrighteousness with God? In today's vernacular, we might simply ask, then is God being unfair? Then is God wrong in this regard? And Paul answers extremely strongly in the second part of verse 14. He gives a strong correction. He says, by no means. By no 
means. Let it never be said. This is not possible. The only righteous one should not, cannot, and will not be charged with injustice. NIV simply says, not at all. The NASB says, may it never be. King James, God forbid. We might say this is unthinkable. No God is not unfair. No God is not unrighteous. No God is not unjust. See, in this section, Paul is expanding upon a notion that he already addressed in Romans 3. For one to declare that God is totally righteous in saving some from a group while rejecting others within that very same group, they must understand, hear me, that all in the group are unrighteous. That all in the group are unrighteous. Unrighteous. In other words, God does not save people that are righteous in their own right while condemning others for their unrighteousness. All in the group are completely unrighteous. God, the only righteous one, saves unrighteous people and condemns unrighteous people according to his character and his choice alone. Romans 3.23, for some have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Pastor Kenny, that's heretical. Yes, the text doesn't say that. It says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Though all are sinners, some are redeemed while others are condemned. The question might be then this. Does God need to treat all sinners the same in order to be just? Does God need to treat each and every sinner exactly the same in order for him to be just? And you can go one of two ways with this. If God's salvation is somehow dependent upon that which is within mankind, then I would argue that he must deal with the sum, the whole, the totality of mankind in the same fashion in order to be just and fair and righteous. Well, why do you say that? Well, again, Romans chapter 3. Listen to what? Paul says about the sum, the whole, the total of mankind. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understand. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asp is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, and their paths are ruin and misery. In the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. This is what the Apostle Paul says about mankind. This is what the Apostle Paul says about you and I, apart from the saving work of the Lord Jesus Christ, that there is not one person in this room or in this earth that is righteous. Now, you might be thinking in your mind right now, Well, certainly some are more righteous than others. I mean, Adolf Hitler, yeah, God should condemn him, but there aren't too many of those guys around. Well, then we look to the book of James, and we think of James chapter 2, verse 10. And James tells us, whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. So in other words, we're all in the same boat. Even your right deeds are prideful and self-righteous. They're not done according to the righteousness of God if you're outside of Christ. So, if God's salvation is somehow dependent upon that which is within mankind, then he must deal with us all completely the same. He must condemn us all or he must extend his mercy to us all because we are all in the same boat. But if God's salvation... If God's salvation is determined by his own choice, apart from anything within man, then there is no injustice on God's part. As he is free to choose on the basis of his divine wisdom and good pleasure without violating any of his attributes. This is why the Apostle Paul is able to answer so strongly, by no Means. Is there injustice on God's part? No, not at all. By no means. This is not possible because God doesn't choose or he doesn't elect or he doesn't extend his mercy 
based upon our actions, our desires, our wants. He does it in his own free, sovereign choice. And Paul goes on to explain this reality. He goes on to explain the lack of injustice on God's part in election by quoting two Old Testament passages, and then he follows each one of them with a concluding statement. So let us look at our third point, which is the first explanation, which is the word to Moses. Verse 15 says, For he, God, says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Paul's quoting from the book of Exodus. I invite you to turn to Exodus 33 with me, please. Paul quotes from the book of Exodus, verbatim, Exodus 33, verse 19. But this is really important. Paul quotes Exodus 33, 19 as a reason, a legitimate reason, why there is no injustice on God's part in the election of some and the rejection of of others. For the sake of context, uh, let us remember what's going on in the book of Exodus. Remember, Exodus chapter 32 is what? The golden calf incident. They have made a covenant with God. Israel, the nation of Israel, made a covenant with God earlier in the book of Exodus. They say, uh, you will be my God, I will be your people. Rather, God says to them, you will be my people and I will be your God. And they say, yes and amen. And then what we have in Exodus chapter 32 is idolatry, idolatrous worship. They make an image that seemingly is supposed to represent Yahweh some way, but the problem with that is they were clearly commanded not to do that. You are to make no graven images in my likeness. You can't create something that looks like God because God is spirit. And so you can't make something and say, oh, that represents God because God is greater than anything that we can make. And so that's the context. That's what happens in Exodus chapter 32. And Moses has some concern. In Exodus 33, this is the threat from God. Moses speaking, or rather the Lord speaking to Moses. Exodus 33, verse 3, Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, and here's the troublesome part. But I will not go up among you. See, God had promised to be with his people. He had promised to take them to the promised land. He promised to be with them every step of the way. And here God makes a threat. He says, look, this idolatrous heart of this nation, you go ahead, Moses, but I'm not going with you. And as we continue in in Exodus 33, Moses intercedes on Israel's behalf. Look with me at 33, verse 16 and 17. Moses, now interceding and speaking to the Lord, says, For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people... Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do, for you found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. So as Moses intercedes, notice what Moses does. He says, look, Lord, this isn't my people. You're telling me to go. You're telling to take these people. No, this is your people. You covenanted with these people. You must go with us. How is everyone supposed to know that we're your people? And how are you going to glorify your name through us if you're not with us? And so he intercedes and he finds favor in God's sight. God says, okay, I'll go with you, but that's not enough for Moses. Look at verse 18 of Exodus 33. Moses said, please show me your glory. Please show me your glory. You have said this to be true, but Lord, I want more. I want more assurance. Look how God, in his grace and in his mercy, responds to Moses. And he, Yahweh, said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. The second part of that verse is obviously what Paul is quoting in Romans chapter 9. I want you to understand something, though. Let's look at the entirety of this verse. Yahweh says to Moses, I will make all my goodness pass before you. 
I will make all my goodness pass before you. So God is declaring something about himself, that as he reveals himself to Moses, that all that he reveals is good, because all of God is good. And one of the things that is good is the verse that's quoted. Part of God's goodness is the fact that he will be gracious to whom he will be gracious, and he will show mercy on whom he will show mercy. If you know the story, Moses goes, he places himself between a cleft of a rock. The Lord is going to the, the pass before him. And in verse 6 and 7 of Exodus 34, the Lord does what he promised to do. Chapter 34, of verse 6. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. He doesn't stop there. But who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. That's so important. This is what God has said about himself, that he will show mercy upon whom he shows mercy and he will have compassion upon whom he has compassion. And he goes further and he gives us further details in chapter 34, verses six and seven. And you know what Moses doesn't do? He doesn't say, I don't like that part. That, that last clause, I, I, I don't like that, Lord. Can we, can we reinterpret that? Can, can you change yourself? Immutable God, are you willing to... Make yourself more like me and my desires. That's not what he does. He bows and he worships. And he says, God, you have declared who you are. And part of who you are is the fact that you have the free sovereign choice to bestow mercy on whoever it is that you bestow mercy upon and to have compassion upon whoever it is that you have compassion. And the right response, brothers and sisters, isn't for us to question God's character. It's not for us to put up our dukes. It's to bow and worship. This is our God. God's prerogative. God proclaims his sovereign selectivity to Moses. And Paul attributes that same sovereign free choice in the book of Romans. We could state it this way. One of God's basic characteristics is his freedom to bestow mercy on whomever he chooses. When we talk about mercy and compassion in Romans chapter 9, mercy is God's granting of favor, benefits, opportunities to those who are unworthy. God having pity, if you will, on those who are in need. And compassion speaks of God's desire to relieve those who are in distress. He will act mercifully and compassionately upon whomever he wishes. And Paul concludes this first expl explanation in Romans 9, verse 16, back in Romans 9. After quoting Exodus 33, verse 19, Paul says, so then. In other words, on the basis of what I've just said, so then, what should we conclude? He says, it depends not on human will, or exertion, but on God who has mercy. What is the it there? The distribution of God's mercy. His ability to have mercy on who he has mercy and compassion, as God extends mercy and compassion, it depends not on human will. It depends not on exertion, but on God. A more literal translation, and I love this, it would be something like this. So then, it is not of him who is willing, nor of him who is running, but of God mercy. The verse makes it even more clear that God's bestowal of mercy is not at all dependent upon man. Paul says two things. He says, not on human will or exertion. Will speaks of the internal desires, the thoughts but he goes more than that. It doesn't only not depend on what we are feeling or what we are thinking or what we are desiring, but it also doesn't depend on our exertion. 
The word literally means running. In this context, it's the outward actions that express the desires. God's extension of mercy is not dependent on how one feels or on what one does. In other words, don't miss the beauty in this passage. But on the mercy in God, on the God who owes no one mercy, yet extends mercy. The Reformation Study Bible says this, when God shows mercy, it is not a person receiving a reward earned by one's own efforts, but God's sovereign free grace extended to undeserving persons who are morally incapable of any acceptable effort. Our problem, brothers, sisters, and friends, is that somehow we think that we are capable of giving some measure, even if it's just a little bit, acceptable effort. We have a problem if we understand that God's mercy is something warranted or deserved or earned by those who receive it. You tell me, who does God owe mercy to? Absolutely no one. He owes mercy to none, so there is no injustice on his part when mercy is shown. If God owed mercy to some and withheld that mercy, and withheld that mercy then he would be unjust. But as it is, God's mercy is something that he owes, is not something that he owes to anyone. Therefore, the distribution of that mercy is completely and totally reliant on his good pleasure. I love what Pastor Jeff said this week, and I think it's crystal clear, that, that Paul is not shocked by the lack of mercy extended to Esau. He, he's not shocked by that. Rather, he's shocked that God chose Isaac and Jacob. We often act as if mercy is something that we deserve, but by definition, that cannot be the case. By definition, it cannot be the case. God has mercy upon whom he has mercy. He will show compassion upon whom he shows compassion. That is one of Paul's explanations. He gives us the second explanation and our last point, which is the word to Pharaoh in verses 17 through 18, showing us that God extends his mercy as he wills. Look with me in Romans chapter 9, verse 17. Paul says, For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Paul again quotes from the book of Exodus. This time he quotes chapter 9, verse 16 to show that there is no injustice on God's part, again, in electing some and rejecting others. And in verse 17, we see a twofold purpose of God. The raising up of Pharaoh indicates that God sovereignly placed Pharaoh in a specific position of power to play a significant role in redemption history. And it's through Pharaoh and his, from our perspective, negative role that a twofold positive purpose of God is seen. The first being the demonstration of God's power, the second being the proclamation of God's name in all the earth. If we would look uh, back at Exodus chapter, beginning in chapter 6 and all the way through chapter 12, but specifically Exodus chapter 7 through 11, that's what we, are, we know as the ten plagues where God de demonstrates his power over and over and over again as Pharaoh refuses to let God's people go. Plague after plague after plague. Sometimes it seems as if Pharaoh is about to relent, but then his heart is hardened and he says, no, I will not let your people go. Eventually God, with the tenth plague, the death of the firstborn, humbles Pharaoh to a point where he's willing to allow the Israelites to leave Egypt. And if you've noticed throughout the rest of Scripture and as Israel leaves Egypt and as they go through wandering and enter into the Promised Land, what is the one thing that all their enemies know about their God? 
that this is the God who executed judgment upon Egypt. This is the God whose power was seen, displayed upon Egypt. This is the twofold purpose of God in the hardening of Pharaoh, that he raised him up to this position of power. And what happens? God's power is demonstrated and all the earth sees that the God of Israel is the one true powerful God. His name, his character, his perfections are proclaimed in all the earth. What we have in the Exodus event, in the Exodus event is God's mercy and God's justice on display in the exact same event. You know what no one ever says? No one ever says, you know what God shouldn't have done? He shouldn't have done that to Pharaoh. And no one ever says that. Well, why? why? Why don't we say that? Because we know that Pharaoh is a bad guy. We know that Pharaoh is a bad guy. We read it. We see the text. We say, yeah, that's what he deserved. God, get him. Get the bad guy, God. Our problem is that we think Moses is a good guy. That's our problem. I'd like to remind you, brothers, sisters, and friends, that Moses is a bad guy. And I want to remind you that you are a bad person as well in your own right. Moses and Pharaoh, wretched sinners, both murderers, So why are we not astonished and astounded by the fact that God did not obliterate Moses when he came upon that burning bush? Why? It's because we think too highly of ourselves. We think we have something to offer God. We think we have something within our own selves that that makes us commendable in the sight of God. And this is not the case. It is on the basis of God's mercy that Moses was not obliterated. Moses was not seeking God when he came across that burning bush. He's running. He left. He committed a crime. He's worried about getting caught, and so he's running. And God, in his mercy, appears to Moses in the burning bush. He is sovereignly free to execute mercy upon whom he executes mercy, to show compassion to whom he shows compassion. One thing that I want you to know, brothers and sisters, is that the mercy of God should make us weak in our knees. should make us fall over. God, how merciful you've been to me, a wretched sinner. What you did to Pharaoh is what I deserve, yet you have treated me like Moses. You've appeared to me through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Before the grace of God, I would be like Pharaoh. But by the grace of God, I'm a friend in his sight. This is the same experience that each and every one of us have had if we are indeed in Christ. I love what one commentator said. He said, the situation is not that people want to be saved but cannot be. Or that they are running after God but cannot find him. Apart from God's drawing them, none are seeking the one true God, not a single one. Which we read in Romans chapter 3. Therefore God's righteousness is upheld because it is manifest through the revelation of his glory, both in saving and in judging, as is seen in the Exodus through Moses and Pharaoh. Through the raising up and subsequent ju- judgment of Pharaoh, God's twofold purpose prevails. His power is on display and his name is proclaimed in all the earth. Another quote from Thomas Schreiner says, God is righteous because he is committed to proclaiming his name and advertising his glory by showing his goodness, grace, and mercy to people as he freely chooses. The, righteous, the righteousness of God is defended then by appealing to his freedom and sovereignty as creator. Paul concludes this explanation in verse 18, our last verse. Paul says, So then, he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. We've already rehearsed the reality of of God sovereignly bestowing his mercy upon whomever he wills, but now Paul restates and reemphasizes emphasizes 
that reality. But Paul goes even further. Paul also says that God hardens whomever he wills. And this is a phrase that is a hard pill for many to swallow. But the text clearly states that this is indeed what God does. The preceding verses give us the context of the hardening of Pharaoh's heart, but here Paul broadens the hardening of a heart to whomever God wills. What does this mean, is the question. What does this mean? What does it mean for a heart to be hardened? Douglas Moo, I think, is correct in stating that the term harden is consistently used in Scripture to depict a spiritual condition that renders one unreceptive and disobedient to God and his word. Let me read that again. If you were to look through the Old and the New Testament, when you see that word harden, when it speaks of someone's heart, it is a term that is consistently used in Scripture to depict a spiritual condition that renders one unreceptive and disobedient to God and his word. God actively hardens those whom he wills. But at the same time, we must understand something that all men have hard hearts. That all men have hard hearts because all men are sinners. As a matter of fact, the only basis by which a hard heart is softened is the mercy of God. Therefore, the hardening of an already hard heart is not a creation of new evil in one's heart. Rather, it is actively handing one over to their already sinful desires. What we can't think when we hear the phrase harden is that God is somehow creating new evil in a man's heart. That is not what's going on. Our hearts are sin-filled and sinful. God's hardening, I believe, refers to him actively handing one over to their already sinful desires. If we were to go back to the book of Exodus, you would see, you don't have to turn there, I'll go there for you really quickly. You would see that both God hardens Pharaoh's heart And Pharaoh hardens Pharaoh's heart. Let me just read these passages to you. Exodus chapter 4, verse 21. God says, I will harden his, speaking of Pharaoh's heart. Chapter 7, verse 3. I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Same chapter, verse 13. Still Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Verse 14. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Verse 22. So Pharaoh's heart remained hardened. Chapter 8, verse 15, Pharaoh saw that there was a a respite. He hardened his heart. Verse 19, but Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Verse 32, but Pharaoh hardened his heart. Verse 7, but the heart of Pharaoh was hardened. Verse 12 of chapter 9, but the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Verse 34, he sinned yet again and hardened his heart, speaking of Pharaoh hardening his heart. Verse 35, so the heart of Pharaoh was hardened. Verse, or chapter 10, verse 1, For I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants. Verse 20 of chapter 10, But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Verse 27, But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Chapter 11, verse 10, The Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Chapter 14, verse 4, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Verse 8, And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. In verse 17 of chapter 14, And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, so that they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host, his chariots, and his horsemen. We cannot get around the fact that God has mercy on whomever he wills, and God hardens whomever he wills. But how we understand that hardening is of immense importance. We see in the Old Testament, but already earlier in this very letter that we've been preaching through, Romans chapter 1, what do we see? Verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. And there we get the detail of sin, the sinfulness of mankind, though God has shown himself himself and declared himself, we suppress the truth of God. And so what does God do? Verse 24, therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie 
and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions for their women, uh, exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God the third time, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not be done. God's hardening isn't a creation of wickedness in our hearts. It's him actively giving over ourselves, sinful men, to their sinful intentions and desires. God is free to express his mercy in the election of some while at the same time expressing his justice in the rejection of others. More than that, God is totally righteous in showing mercy to some while hardening others. And that is why Paul says to the question, is there injustice on God's part by no means. Charles Hard, speaking of the hardening of Pharaoh's heart, and by extension, extension, the hardening of all hearts, he says this, the reason, therefore, of Pharaoh's being left to perish while others were saved was not that he was worse than others, but because God has mercy on whom he will have mercy. It was because among the criminals at his bar, he pardons one and not another, as seems good in his sight. He, therefore, who is pardoned, cannot say it was because I was better than others. Well, he who is condemned must acknowledge that he receives nothing more than the just recompense of his sins. We've seen that there is no injustice on the part of God, that he is free to sovereignly choose whomever he wills. He has mercy upon whom he has mercy. He has compassion upon whom he has compassion. None of that is dependent on our thoughts, our desires, our exertion. It depends on the God, the mercying, the mercying God. So the question is, is what do we do with this hard doctrine? What do we do with this doctrine that I believe is crystal clear in Scripture, yet at the same time is not easy for us to swallow? There are three points of application that I want to give to you in closing. The first is humility, brothers and sisters. Humility. If you rightly understand that you thought, felt, and did nothing to receive God's mercy, then should we not be the most humble people on the face of the earth? Not because anything that I offered you, God, not because anything I did, not because of all my hard work and all my diligence and all my tenacity, not because of any of that, but because you did what you pleased to do, and you extended mercy to me, how we should bend with Moses and worship. We must be humble people, brothers and sisters. If we rightly understand God's salvation, it is foolish for us to be prideful. The two cannot rightly coincide with one another. We must be the humble of the humble. What else do we do with this doctrine? I want to encourage you in evangelism. Some people take this doctrine and they say, well, if God chooses whom he chooses, then I don't have anything to do. Not only does God choose the ends and determine the ends, but he also chooses and determines the means. And the means is the church proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I have been given all authority on heaven and on earth, in heaven and on earth. And then what does he say? Go, therefore, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded, and lo, I am with you to the very end of the age. If we rightly understand the sovereignty of God, sovereign election, the free choosing of God, then we should have confidence to go to our friends and our neighbors and our baristas and our whatever else and say, this doesn't depend on how persuasive I am. This doesn't, uh, uh, this doesn't depend on how much knowledge I have. This doesn't uh, uh, depend on uh, if I'm able to, to tickle the one thing that they have questions about. 
It depends upon the mercy in God. I just must be faithful to proclaim the message clearly. That God came to earth in the person of Jesus Christ and he lived a perfect life. The life that we are required to live but cannot live because of our sinfulness. And he died a substitutionary death. That anyone who would believe in him would be forgiven of their sin as he took the wrath of God upon himself. More than that, he rose on the third day, proving that he has power over sin and death and Satan. He ascended into heaven. He's seated at the right hand of God, and he's coming again to judge the living and the dead. Would you please believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ? I plead with you. I beg of you. That's the message, brothers and sisters. We scatter seed, and God causes the growth. If we rightly understand this doctrine, and we can be confident in our evangelism. The last and third point of application is trusting God when those who are closest to you have not yet been saved. You and I don't know who's elect. You and I don't know who God will save. God is free to do what he wills, And we don't know all that he will. Specifically, we don't know the people whom he has elected before the foundations of the earth. So what do I do when it seems that my mom isn't a Christian? What do you do when your brother or your friend converts to Islam? What do you do when your son walks away from the faith? What do you do when your neighbor that you've been preaching to for 30 years just doesn't want to hear it? What do you do? You trust God. Preach Christ, and you pray to the only one who has the ability, the right, and the sovereign authority to extend mercy upon whom he has mercy. And you hold on to the fact that there is nothing that God does that is unjust, that is wrong, that is unrighteous. And you humble yourself before this sovereign God, and you say, not as I will. Not as I will but as you will. Let us pray. Father, I pray that we would take you at your word. I pray that we would be the most humble people on the face of the earth. Numbers 12, verse 3, I believe, says that Moses was the most humble man on the earth. And do we not see that in the text that we just read? That as you proclaim your goodness and say that you will have mercy upon whom you have mercy and have compassion upon whom you have compassion, as you declare your glorious name before him as he's in the cleft of the rock, he worships. He says, thus saith the Lord and he's humbled before you. Would that be the case with us? Lord, I pray that we would be confident in you and in your will rather than in ours. Help us to be about your business. And Lord, I pray that we would trust you. We confess, God, that we are frail and that we are weak. There are times that we uh, think things and feel things that are contrary to your word. Many of us have loved ones, ones that we have preached the gospel to, ones that maybe have even grown up in the church, and we so desire for them to come to you. But Lord, we depend on you and your will for that. Would we never, ever cease praying and seeking and speaking and declaring with all patience that we speak the truth and love and depend on you, O God, to do that which brings you the most glory. We're humbled before you. Be glorified in our midst. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.